This is Midweek Bible Study with Pastor Alan Deuce. Hey Richfield, welcome back to uh, Wednesday Night Bible Study. Uh, last week my daughter Laura had surgery, so Jan and I went to be with her for a few days and uh, we still, even though we were out of town, had to make sure that the yard was mowed, the flowers were watered, and the mail was picked up. I mean, just life stuff, but it had to happen. Yesterday was trash day at our house, just life stuff, but it's got to happen. Jan's uh, sister and her family were missionaries for many, many years, and they have lived in some really amazing, exotic places around the world. Focused on telling people about Jesus, it's been incredible. But they still, wherever they are, have to make sure that the yard gets mowed, the flowers get watered, and the mail gets picked up. Life stuff. Jesus' disciples were following him around for three years. They interrupted their normal lives. They chose to follow Jesus. And then Jesus was crucified, buried, and then Easter happened. He rose from the dead. He appeared to them on Easter Sunday more than once, and then he appeared to them again the following week. But now it's later. In John chapter 21, now what? Where's Jesus? He's alive, but he hadn't really given them some significant, specific instructions, completely at least, yet. So, where to from here? When I personally started following Jesus, it was amazing. I mean, I remember the grass just looked greener, the flowers were more vivid, it was awesome. But but as I follow Jesus every day, life still happens. John chapter 21 is Jesus saying, here is what life should look like when I am following Jesus. And the first most important message that the Gospel of John wants to make certain that we get here in this final chapter of the Gospel of John is redefine your life by Jesus is alive. John 21, 1. Remember, John chapter 20 almost looked like the end of the gospel. And here we have this final, final chapter. And what's the very first verse afterward? Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee, reminding them, reminding me, redefine everything. The disciples really weren't sure yet what's next. I mean, how should life be different with Jesus? And the answer is... You know, for you and me and them is, well, it, it should be completely different. The answer is everything and in some ways nothing. I mean, when you follow Jesus, you still go to work, you still have a family, you still have to make sure the lawn gets mowed and the trash gets dealt with. Houses still have to be maintained, children cared for. I mean, life happens. So in some ways, nothing changes. But when I'm following Jesus, everything changes. I realize my house belongs to Jesus. My job belongs to Jesus. My life belongs to Jesus. My children belong to Jesus. Every decision I make gets filtered through Jesus. I honor the government. I respect the police. I pay my taxes because, because Jesus calls me to be a good citizen. I treat my wife and my children differently because Jesus tells me to love my wife like he loves the church and he tells me not to exasperate my children but to nurture them and to love them. I give my full self to my job because Jesus tells me to work for my employer as if I were working for God Himself. Every aspect of my life gets filtered through my relationship with Jesus. Now, arguably this progresses slightly differently for every one of us because we all come to a relationship with Jesus and we all follow Jesus on a slightly different path from a, from a slightly different place. But every one of our lives should be redefined by the reality, the realization that Jesus is alive. But it helps to remember that each one of us has our own story with Jesus. Look again at verse 1. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also called Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. Now, these guys were together because of Jesus. Uh, but they were also fishermen, 
Each of them was a fisherman, so they probably knew each other before Jesus recruited them. They, their real point of connection was Jesus, but they probably knew each other before Jesus. They at least knew about one another. They fished the same lake. They all had the same profession. They would have interacted somewhat. So here they are now, after three years following Jesus together, significantly developed a relationship. They're hanging out, nothing to do, weren't sure what was next. For three years, their focus had been follow Jesus. But now, they're not really sure. What's the next step? What, where are we going? Jesus had them in what I like to call the waiting zone. No clear, definite next step. Follow me. Redefine your life according to following me. But in this moment, not sure exactly where to from here. God does... God does some amazing things in all of our lives in the waiting zone. That's where they were. But Jesus wanted them to keep staying focused on Him. That's the priority. Redefine my life. Jesus is alive. But what's next? One great choice that they made <clears throat> was to stay together, to hang out together. When I'm working on next steps with Jesus, spending time with other Christians, my brothers and sisters in Christ, is always a good idea. We need one another. We need one another to help us stay focused on Jesus. We need one another to encourage each other. We need one another to help us continue to make the best decisions possible. These guys were together, and Peter made a decision. And his decision influenced everyone else. Look at verse 3. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Now, Peter couldn't go fishing alone. The kind of boat that they fished in, it needed multiple people to do what needed to be done. So he was assuming that if he said he was going fishing, at least some of them would go with him. He made a decision that influenced other people. Jesus hadn't given them a real specific assignment yet, so Peter chose to go to work. That's a pretty good idea. Jan's grandmother used to always say, turn your worry into work. This weekend is Labor Day. God is the creator. God is incredibly productive. He loves productivity. The Apostle Paul said we all should be productive. In fact, he goes so far as to say, if you don't work, you shouldn't eat. We were created by God to be productive laborers, to work. Peter used his influence to get them doing something positive, to get them to go and to work. But see, the point here is we all have influence, so use it for Jesus. Use your influence for good. I went to school with a guy who was always getting into trouble. And you can just guarantee that anybody who was ever around him was going to drink too much, get involved in fights, wreck cars, and just generally cause trouble. Being around this guy, he always influenced people negatively. On the other hand, everyone wanted to be around this guy that I knew in college that we just called Prof. He was wise. He had this incredible sense of humor. I mean, every time I was around him, I learned something. I always had a great time. I usually found myself going away from interactions with Prof, just feeling more positive and productive about life. Prof loved people, and he loved Jesus. And he leveraged every moment to encourage people to live more productive lives for Jesus. He used his influence for good. Peter and the guys went fishing, and Jesus showed up. Jesus met them where they were. Look at verse 4. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. I have always been fascinated by the moments in the Scripture where the disciples didn't recognize Jesus at first. They were all resurrection moments. And this is one of those moments where they, they, they had known Him when He was alive, but to see the resurrected Jesus was still difficult for them, to believe that it was Him. That's an encouragement to all of us. And it's a reminder also, how many times, how many times has Jesus been standing right next to me and I didn't recognize Him? See, we need to expect Jesus to meet us right where we are. 
At work, at home, at the ball game, on the fishing boat, wherever you are, Jesus is going to come looking for you. It's what He does. When I'm hunting, I am constantly looking for that animal that I'm expecting to see. We need to to have that same kind of expectation, that same kind of anticipation. We need to expect Jesus to show up. Look for Jesus. Look for Jesus and you will find that He's there. Because Jesus intentionally enters our world. Verse 5, He called out to them, Friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. You know, when I'm at my daughter's house, I am almost always looking for my granddaughter. And I go and I enter her world. Last week, I got to spend several days with my granddaughter. We played with dolls, we played truck, we played Amazon Delivery, which is this weird game that Jan made up, uh, but my granddaughter enjoyed it, so who cares? We beat up toys, we, we colored, we drew pictures, she wrote her name for me, we went to the science museum, we did all kinds of crazy things because I wanted to enter her world. See, I want her to know that Papa loves her enough to enter into her world and not just experience expect her to come and enter mine. Jesus loved us so much that He left heaven and came and entered our world. And He hasn't stopped doing that. He's still entering our world, coming alongside us, coming where we are. The disciples were fishing, so Jesus went to the lake. He identified what was happening in their lives, including the problem that they were having, and He said about fixing, helping with the problem that they were facing in their lives. It's what He does. Look at verse 6. Jesus said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some fish. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Now, for the disciples this day, Jesus created this miraculous catch of fish. He was proving to them His identity again. He is the Lord of everything, even the Lord of the fish in the Sea of Galilee. There is nothing that Jesus cannot do. I prayed with someone early this morning before she went into surgery, and she still needed surgery. You know, I I wish Jesus had healed her immediately. I know He could have. I know He does sometimes. But He doesn't always do things that way. But I'm certain that He answered our prayer. I know that He helped her and He was with her during surgery. And I am confident that He will be with her as she recovers. See, Jesus always knows our need. Jesus always cares and He can help. And His actions in this moment reminded them and they remind us of who He is. Look at verse 7. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and he jumped into the water. When Jesus helped them to catch fish, John immediately realized, hey, that's Jesus. And he told Peter, who instantly recognized Jesus once John had pointed out to him that it was Jesus. We need to be about the business of pointing Jesus out to one another. When we see Jesus, when we recognize Jesus, we need to help one another. John did that for Peter. We need to do it for one another. In my Sunday school class uh, last Sunday, Anne shared two miracle stories that had just happened in her life and in her family's life. And suddenly it changed the whole atmosphere in our class. It encouraged all of us. It lifted up our attitude and it reminded us of who Jesus is. And from that moment on, we were praying together with more faith and we studied the Scripture together with a, a changed attitude. See, when we focus focus on who Jesus is and what Jesus does, it changes everything. Peter immediately dove into the water and he swam straight to Jesus. When you see Jesus, the only correct response is to run, swim, jump, fly, anything you can do. Just get to Jesus. Verse 8. 
The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Sometimes we say, Jesus, could you come over here? I, I need you to do something for me. What we really need to say is, Jesus, where are you? Because I want to come to you. The disciples saw Jesus and they went to him. And as they did, Jesus met their need. Now, he'd already given them this miraculous catch of fish. For them, that was money in the bank. They were professional fishermen. It was their job. But now he not only does that, but he feeds them uh, from other fish that they don't know where he got. Uh, it doesn't matter. He's the Lord of all the fish in the sea. He had fish there for them immediately. He was providing for their needs. He was showing them they could trust him with their lives. When I run to Jesus, he meets my needs. You know, since I've been following Jesus, He has always provided for my needs. Most of our married life, Jan and I have lived pretty simply and pretty frugally, but we have never gone hungry. We have never had a bill that was late because God had not provided enough money. It was always there. He has always provided. He's always been there to give us strength when, when we needed it, when I've been hurting, when I've needed guidance. Jesus was always there helping me to know how to navigate, where to go, what to do, next. And always, life is better when we do what Jesus says. Verse 10, Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you've just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153, but even with so many, the net was not torn. Life with Jesus means getting to Jesus and then doing what Jesus says. Jesus already had fish cooked, but he said, bring some of what you just caught. So Peter did. Now, there are three words for fish that are used in this story. Jesus cooked a small fish, and that's not the normal New Testament word. In verse 13, Jesus fed the disciples a fish. In verse 5, Jesus asked them if they caught any fish. And, and the word is from a word for food that can mean fish. It was a polite way of saying, do you guys have anything to eat? He asked them knowing they didn't, but that was okay because he had already prepared a meal. And then Jesus took a little fish and he fed them more than enough. Over and over, John is pointing out the fact that Jesus provided for them miraculously fish in abundance. The third fish word is the normal word for fish. Jesus identified fish for the disciples while they were fishing, which they then caught. Just another little miracle for Jesus. See, walking with Jesus means doing what He says even when it doesn't make sense. Like throwing the nets back in the water after you've been fishing for the entire evening and caught nothing. Walking with Jesus means trusting Him to provide. It means trusting Him when the little fish He cooked couldn't possibly feed everyone, but somehow it does. See, when I live life God's way in every way, it works. Walking with Jesus, I've discovered that truth and integrity work a lot better than lying. That, that, that truth and integrity work a lot better than cheating or stealing. I've found that a soft answer usually does turn away wrath. So, trust in, a, in Jesus is better than alternate choices, whatever they may be. Faith really can overcome fear. Trusting Jesus, doing what He says, it's, it's about who He is and doing what Jesus says do. And the more I do, the more I run to Him and put my trust in Him and follow Him, the more clearly He reveals Himself to me. Verse 12, Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared to ask Him, Who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them, and He did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to His disciples after He was raised from the dead. The disciples saw Jesus die. Now they're seeing the resurrected Christ for at least the third time. 
See, sometimes it's hard to believe, but, but the more you turn to Jesus, the more you run to Jesus, the clearer He becomes. So keep looking to Jesus. Keep running to Jesus. Keep listening to Jesus. Look for Him. He's there. He is there for you right now. Keep looking. And the more you see Him, the clearer He will be. Let's pray together. Lord, thank You. Thank You that we can trust You, that You are who You say You are, and You do what You promise You will do. Thank You, Jesus, for the truth of Your resurrection, for the hope that we have in You. I pray that for each one, that You will become more and more clear as we look to you and follow you today. In your strong and mighty name we pray. Amen. Thanks for being with me today again. God bless you and have a great week.